of the boiler man. Hey, Nancy. Hey, Jake. Hey, what? You like jazz? I love jazz. You like weird jazz theory that doesn't actually make much sense? No, I like to stick to like kind of blue and like... uh, Well, guess what, Jake? What? We're going to talk about kind of blue today, too. Yay! We're not going to talk about kind of blue. Well, we kind of are. That's true. A little bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. But mostly weird, crazy jazz theory. Today's going to be a super duper nerd episode if... You are not of the jazz nerd slash music theory nerd proclivity. You can, you know, skip to like 45 minutes in where we start doing our rants or whatever. Yes, because you will not want to hear any of this. <laughs> we don't really want to talk about it, yeah. but the world needs to know. Yeah, the world needs to know. There, doing a I think there's some interesting shit in here, and I'm excited to talk about it. I've never done any of these things while I play before. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, okay. it'll be interesting. Yeah, so specifically, we're not talking about, like, standard jazz theory. We're assuming, if you're listening to this, you have a decent understanding of, like, modes and chords. Chord scales. And th- chord scale like theory, yeah. You're, you know, whatever you learn in jazz school. These are, well, with one exception, these are more out there theories. Esoteric. Based on the initial jazz bullshit. Yeah. For the most part, uh, more or less. Okay, uh, you're gonna. We're being super vague, and it's probably really annoying. But like, you're just gonna have to get over it because I don't know what we else we talk about. Because we have four different topics. Yeah, we, we have four different composer theorists. Yeah, I yeah, guess. yeah. Um, let's just jump in because I don't think there's anything else we can do. We're just about to get heavy here. Yeah, it's about to get heavy. We are going to start with George Russell. George Russell. <laughs> George Russell is a composer. And yeah. band leader. Yep. And probably most famous for his theory book and method, the Lydian <laughs> chromatic concept of tonal organization. Oh, man. That's a wordy title. It's a wordy ass book. It is a wordy ass book. <laughs> um, to, I guess, the very basic way of understanding this is that instead of basing everything around the major scale, mm-hmm. like in traditional tonal harmony we do, he chose to base it all around Lydian due to tonal gravity. Yes. And <laughs> actually, that concept almost makes... It, I think it makes sense in the way he's describing it, and I think it's a nice kind of useful tool for a more stable, I guess, modal center for, mm-hmm. like, if you want to write in that style. Uh, the idea being that if you organize everything tertiarily, so C, E, G, B, D, F, A in the major scale, the F... Cl- um, has the minor ninth against the E at the mm. bottom of the second tertiary note. And in general, it's a little less stable. However, if you raise that degree to an F sharp, then it becomes very stable and grounded. Exactly. And that's There's, the whole. Yes. And it, also the stacked fifth thing. We'll talk about that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah, it basically takes away the need to resolve. So he, exactly. he thinks of it vertically as opposed to horizontally. In horizontal mm. music, we'd have like the two, five, one. Yeah. He's thinking vertically where each chord sort of exists in its own space until you move to the next chord sure and yes so the how i think he comes to lydian being the tonal center of all tonal centers is his concept of tonal gravity where the moving down a fifth would be the strongest motion yeah do and, the overtones here. <laughs> yeah, actually he gives into yeah, that yeah, later yeah, in the yeah. book um uh but yes yeah, so if you start on any note and you keep moving down in fifths eventually once you get to se- the seventh note you will have a lydian scale right okay so, and then from there, so Lydian, and then you've got your next mode, which would be like Mixolydian, and so mm-hmm. on like that. So, yes, if he stopped there, and this is where like kind of blue comes in handy, because mm-hmm. Miles Davis and Bill Evans were both not formally taught, but talked to <clears throat> and influenced by George Russell's yeah, yeah. theory here. And so that really did open up the door to like modal jazz. So you have something like So What, where there isn't any resolution in the composition yeah. itself. It's just D minor, <clears throat> D Dorian then to E-flat Dorian, yeah, yeah, yeah. whatever. So that, I think, is actually a really important thing to happen in jazz. Yep. Probably the most important thing that George Russell ever did. Not to say yeah. people weren't playing around with that idea first, but, you know, he was... He he, he was, a, like, a big figurehead in, yeah. like, that you could always go to as a justification for doing it. And also, he was pretty prominent already. He was, as, yes, yeah, yes, so. he was. Um so as far as like modal jazz goes, it kind of does go back to George Russell yeah. and 
modal jazz obviously influenced every jazz after that and every music forever, ever, and yeah. ever and ever um so had it all stopped there <laughs> we would have been okay yeah i didn't write down where i stopped but like it was uh it was when he started really breaking down uh tonal gravity and then the 11 scales of lydian but okay the 11 scales of lydian makes sense in his justification you know what i mean no, I disagree. Okay. <laughs> I don't right, think it right. does, honestly. I, I mean, to me, it's a little more randomly, like, grab bag than something like a Messian's Moans of Limited Transposition where it's mathematically proofed out, Sh- kind of. Sure. Okay, so here's the deal. There are, yes, there's 11 different scales. Yeah. There are seven principal Lydian scales. Yes. And then there are four auxiliary scales. <laughs> <laughs> and this is... <sighs> George Russell, <laughs> No! <laughs> I really feel like he had this good concept. Like we were saying, he's like, Lydian, and basing yeah. it there, it's like, okay, I can see. The first then, two chapters of this book are very convincing mm-hmm. to me. Yes, and then this, he starts talking about the concept of Lydian chromatics. Right. Scales, okay, and that's where you add, essentially, the remaining notes that are in the Lydian scale. <laughs> um, and that makes sense to me, too, because then it allows us to get to, like, other modes or, you know, mixing modes and talking yeah, notes bar, and shit like chords, that, whatever. Yeah. Um, but to me, it's like he had this really good concept and then he had to figure out how to fit all the other shit that people were doing into <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, and yeah. it doesn't make much sense yeah. to me. And that's kind of the problem, is that this book uh, makes a lot of sense for its scope. And the scope, uh, George Russell, very smart, um, very big brain, very good at concepts and all these kind of things. He needed to realize that the scope of the Lydian chromatic concept needed to be smaller and didn't need to encompass every jazz song ever or every uh, even like classical piece ever or music theory in general. This is not an all-encompassing new style of harmony. It's not. And we'll get to that in a second, but in his book, he does analyze a lot of like Bach. And yeah. he's like, well, obviously Bach wasn't thinking the blah, blah, blah thing here that I'm uh, analyzing this as. But, you know, he just he, had the intuition of the it. vertical <laughs> gravity. Yeah, the, right. the, his tonal uh, gravity, Bach, Bach had that tonal gravity on lock, dude. Before we like get into like talking about it, I do want to play a little George Russell just so we can kind of hear the music he was making with this. Yep. So this is the title track off of Aesthetics because uh-huh. jazz is jazz good. Ti- uh, before you start that, jazz titles, not even once. Not even once. Yep. That's All it. right. So I'll just play a little Aesthetic. Is the bass only in the left ear? Like, all yeah, the way to that's the left? Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's what I was about to say. And also, that poor bass player, dude. You know how annoying <laughs> it is to walk at, like, fucking 340? Um, I mean, pretty cool tune, I'd say. I would say so. Yeah, I really love uh, that, the angularness of the melody. Mm-hmm. and um, It has a very strong sense of resolution and Definitely. direction. Yeah, yeah, so I think, like, I will say George Russell really believed in his theory and he executed it well he really did i mean you could obviously analyze that in maybe a more traditional way Mm -hmm. but i definitely that's what i was gonna say it's not too far away from jazz theory at all it's not um i think it can be explained relatively well i think it really could but i do believe he was using his theory in mind when composing it so Mm -hmm. i guess that's what matters well also i I do think there is a slight uniqueness in there somewhere i would have to actually sit sit down and analyze George Russell, which is something I'm not going to do. We are not going to do that. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I do think there's a slight uniqueness to it. And in the way, like uh, certain s- parts of that resolve, like for instance, when it goes into the B section there, because this is like a, kind of an AABA tune, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when it gets to the bridge or whatever, it's, it does feel a little different in how it gets there. Like that's partially because of the angularness of the melody and just that kind of concept in general. But I do think there's a difference somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I think, I mean, 
at the very least he has his style and his voice mm -hmm. and i I, and think, I think it's cool i do i like george russell like we're gonna shit talk him a bit but i actually like his music yeah, a lot same here especially I like his listening like to later him. stuff where he gets kind of electronic and weird and funky and stuff <laughs> it's cool it's cool i even like his quote-unquote straight ahead yeah stuff. yeah no. in, even mm -hmm. in this example i think it's like compelling jazz exactly i would agree I, obviously very influential on yeah, what yeah, would come yeah. after it mm -hmm. for sure um but yeah let's get into the nitty-gritty here a little oh boy so again had we stopped at lydian and modes yeah and just these i mean he brings it up in his book it's sort of the um oh man why wow, i'm blanking on the name now that a old school sax player who did like body and soul oh fuck, fuck. me are we i'm stupid Sin uh, coleman hawkins coleman hawkins thank, thank you. you god huh. he brings up coleman hawkins versus lester young yeah and the big thing there is he's saying lester plays more uh horizontally essentially saying if you take like you know four chords he's thinking more general key center yeah. resolving to the major scale yeah whereas coleman hawkins would play more vertically sure uh, inclined so each chord would he would sort of do its own thing on which i think in the it, sense, it's more the it's, standard of jazz at this point. Yeah, or yeah, at that point too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So basically, getting out of like the big band era swing into yeah, the yeah. more like bebop kind yeah. of thing, right? Yeah, very vertical stacked. Yeah, exactly. So essentially, he took that concept and decided to figure out a way that you could add all twelve notes onto any chord and make it make sense. Yeah. So, <laughs> you come up with these seven principal scales of the sure. Lydian chromatic concept. Yeah. Now, here's the first thing that falls apart to me. Yeah, let's see. So, to get the Lydian scale, we stack it in fifth, yeah. right? It's, that's great. Yeah. So, we start on C. Yeah. We're going to end up all the way at F sharp. Yeah. Right? And that's, that's and then you And then you stop because C sharp will make you want to kill yourself. That's yeah. exactly the thing. Yeah, I know. So, that's why you don't. <sighs> so, instead of going to F sharp, then going to C sharp, yeah. which would make sense, and then finishing it out that way... He goes F sharp, then goes to G sharp. Mm -hmm. And then he continues from there. So it's a G sharp, D sharp, A sharp, F, and then C sharp at the end. Yeah. So he breaks his fifth pattern. Yeah. And the justification offered in the book is like, okay, so first of all, George Russell is a good writer, I think. Like, mm. Well, I think he managed to put a lot of words behind this concept. That is true. <laughs> I, I guess good is in the, the eye of the beholder, but I think he he's managed... Very, he's very articulate. <laughs> that's that's yeah, what I mean. Yeah. Is he managed to justify his decision to alter this pattern pretty yes. well. But at the end of the day, it's just like, it doesn't matter because that pattern being broken like that and not even... I don't know how to say this, but like to the extent yeah. that, it's, that it's fucked with, like just for... Uh, it's like he... He, again, it's like you said earlier, he had the concept and had to figure out, a con yes. it's like a confirmation bias thing. Mm -hmm. You have the idea and you want to figure out how to make this uh, stuff that doesn't quite work and put right. it in there. And anyway. it makes much more sense to put it the way he put it. Like if we're looking at sort of adding chromatic notes, I think this particular order makes a lot more sense than going straight to straight C, to C sharp, sharp or yeah, whatever. That, does, right? that doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so essentially what happens though is after you add any of these notes, you get into what he calls the tone orders. Yeah. So Lydian by itself would be a seven tone order. There is no eight tone order. I don't know why. Uh, <laughs> so D sharp, talk, right? whatever. D sharp would be nine and so on. And the idea is eventually you'd have a 12 tone order yep. where literally you can play any note on any chord. Mm -hmm. So the seven scales are Lydian, obviously. Yeah. We add G sharp. So that's going to replace G. So we get Lydian augmented. Mm -hmm. Okay. So... I'm with you so, so far, far. So we're good. Yeah. This is now adding like melodic minor into yep. the equation. So and I think the, there's oh, cool. another melodic minor scale in like two scales. Yeah. There yeah, is. Next we have the Lydian diminished. Yeah. I wanted. To, I actually wanted to talk about Lydian diminished. Yeah. Uh, the scale sucks ass. <laughs> <laughs> I don't mind the scale, but it doesn't. <laughs> it, 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 yeah, that's what I mean. Is it doesn't really. Yeah. The, the tonal grab. No. <laughs> the tonal grab. <laughs> George Russell. <laughs> Well, here's one of the things I don't like about it either. So essentially, okay, so we're like we're in C, whatever. Next note, D sharp, E flat in sure. the pattern. Uh, so he's using that to replace the E natural. So it becomes essentially it's like you see melodic minor with a sharp fourth or Lydian with a minor third, yeah. however you want to put it. But why not Lydian sharp nine? Uh, to me, that's, that would make more of a logical th that transition. That does make more sense, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I guess it doesn't really matter because no one uses those scales anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I play that shit all the time, bro. All the things you are, fucking Lydian diminished all day. Oh, my God. Um, so anyway, okay, cool. We got that. Now we get to the B flat. And now there are two... So here's it again. Now there's two scales that fall into this tone order. I think the 10 tone order we're at now. Yep. 
So first is the Lydian flat seven. Yep. So well, that's, that's the, again. Yeah, that's the melodic minor mode. Exactly. Yeah. Um, cool. So Lydian with a flat seven. Yep. Makes, Makes sense. Lydian this is, all, four, this yeah. is all working out. Then the auxiliary augmented scale. I read the scale and like didn't believe it and then went back and looked at it. Whole tone. It's whole yeah, tone. Yeah, it's a whole tone scale. That's a whole tone scale. He, why did he? Uh, the auxiliary augmented scale. Yeah, it's not. Does he know what the augmented scale is? <laughs> <laughs> the augmented scale is very different. It gets from... worse. It gets worse. Because yeah. then we add the next note, which would oh, be in, was... in the key of C, we'll, would be F natural. Oh, yeah. what, was the, what was the name of the scale? It was like... Well, I, it's the auxiliary diminished auxiliary scale. Auxiliary diminished, that's However, right. However, auxiliary diminished is already, already a, a scale. Thing. Yes. That's already a scale. So... I forget. Is that, is that, the, altered, is that the altered scale with the E natural? Yeah. Uh, I can't remember. It's basically... It's, uh, diminished starting on like the seventh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Exactly. But he, the auxiliary diminished scale in his theory is just the plain diminished scale. Right. And that's weird. The scale already existed and... But he gave it a different name. And then finally, the last one, note you add, again, is that C sharp, that flat nine, and you get the auxiliary diminished blues scale, blues scale. <laughs> which we would refer to as the auxiliary diminished scale. Yes, that's so. the real oxygen, yeah. But once you get to that note, you have... 12 notes that you can essentially you can go up and down through these series of seven scales right and assuming you're on the whatever chord for that long so there is a method to this madness he it's there lays it out and it basically gets more chromatic mm -hmm. as you progress it's more the, lydian chromatic but then what a concept <laughs> there's oh. stupid things that i hate like when he goes to the lydian flat sevens and he talks about the chords for that yeah or chord mode chord as he modes, puts it yeah. um he refers to it not as a dominant seven chord. It's a major seven chord flat seven. Yeah, that's... Because there aren't... It's all Lydian. It's all major seven. Everything is a major seven yeah, chord. That's right. a very, but like, you can't a, have that, yeah. Yeah, so it's a major flat seven. Yeah, major flat seven. Uh, that, that's, a, that's a yikes. That's a official yikes from me. Yes. That hurts. Because th the dominant seven is a very, very strong sound. Yeah. Um, obviously present because of the tritone. And the tritone being a very strong interval, believe it or not. But again, we don't want resolution here. That's right. So. Well, you can't, because I guess you can't think of a dominant seven like that. But like, think, yeah. does thinking of it as an F major seven flat seven lead to decreased resolution then? Is that the idea? Well, I think what leads to decreased resolution is the sharp four in it. Yeah. Because, well, again, we'll get to the actual mixolydian in a second here. But I think it's just that literally everything has to be a major chord. Sure. And well, and he continues that. So the, he even says... So, like, the first mode of L780 scales is a major or a altered major chord. Mm -hmm. The second mode is always a seventh or an altered seventh. The third is always a major or a minor sharp five, and so on like that. So, in his theory, every chord through each of these scales has to be the same bass chord starting sure. with. Cool. I, yeah. I, I, that I mean, to me, <laughs> to me, it's like, why not? But, like... Because it makes it way harder to remember all the things about oh, all this yeah, shit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, like... I have no problems with, um, let's, I guess, I don't want, I would put this book in like the category of a treatise or something like mm -hmm. that, you know, something that explains a very nuanced idea from the dude's perspective. And from that sense, I don't have a problem with this book at all. Sure. And I, I mean, I definitely have unbelievable amount of respect for George Russell. Um, dude's, dude's a brainiac and writes cool music. Mm -hmm. But I guess my problem would be with the perception of this book, maybe. I mean, yeah. I, but I don't know who well, actually likes this book then. So I mean, know. apparently, yeah, like, he keeps name dropping all over the place of people uh -huh. using this book. Uh, he does, he don't do stupid shit. Like, there's a section in here where he analyzes a, the first chorus of Giant Steps, Coltrane's solo. Sure. And there's one part, I think it's on a D7, where Coltrane plays an E flat. Oh, what a okay, fucking world. So, yeah, yeah, okay, basically going back to fucking, like, Charlie Parker and all yeah, that. Yeah, like, that's, just, that's it's, a very classic b Exactly. Line. George Russell analyzes that as the second mode of the Lydian diminished scale. Genius. But the, okay, so, but that kind of falls apart. Okay. So John, I don't know if you didn't, our listeners know Giant Steps. The D7 in Giant Steps, did you know, you know where that goes? Does it go to G? It goes to G. <gasps> it goes to G Lydian. Oh. Oh! <laughs> George Russell. <laughs> the giant steps analysis is so funny because Coltrane doesn't like 
do this shit. At no, all. no, no, no. George, or, wow, George, George Coltrane. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, John Coltrane's methodology was very strictly major third transposition yeah, related. Yeah, and then very all, simple. And every chord, he's essentially just playing the arpeggio with like the ninth thrown. Yeah, yeah. That's and literally almost with, the entire thing. It's the solo. entire solo with 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 good contours and obviously yeah, John yeah. Coltrane's awesome. But exactly, like, but like it's it not can, as complicated. It's not a fucking Lydian diminished second mode <laughs> on a D seven. I'm curious what he thinks the next one is. Then, like, what does he think the G is? Like, so that brings us to the four auxiliary scales that were not <laughs> considered the seven principal scales of the Lydian. <sighs> The four auxiliary scales, which again, I literally think is just to write off anything that doesn't quite neatly <laughs> fall into this. The first one is the major scale. Oh my god. So if someone's playing a major scale, it's like, oh, well, he's just using so the, the, the auxiliary. The, auxil the first auxiliary <laughs> mode of Lydian, yeah. chromatic. Yes. The second one would be major scale flat seven. <laughs> not even shit. I'm, I'm, I'm not playing Mixolydian, dude. Major. I, I'm playing. <laughs> the second mode of the Lydian chromatic <laughs> auxiliary series. <laughs> the third, hey, you're a fucking idiot. Oh my God. The third one is, I believe it's like major sharp five, but it's the bebop scale. So yeah, like five, yeah. sharp five, six, yeah, one. Yeah. Uh, adding the sharp five. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then the fourth one would be the African American blues yeah, scale. I, I, I did see that on the list and then I laughed. So those are the ones that people play a lot and he can't fit into Lydian. <laughs> so <laughs> therefore, better come up with some names, motherfucker. <laughs> So this is where it starts getting weird. Now, I did want to play someone else doing this. So yeah. um, Eric Dolphy mm -hmm. is actually one of my favorite horn players. Yeah, he, did, he did play with and study with George Russell a lot. And uh, George Russell does put a chorus of one of his solos on here. Um, I'm not saying that Dolphy was using the method, but he was at least aware of it and practiced it. So I think it at least was inspired by this method yeah i, I would have, i would i'm guessing again yeah there's there's cool stuff to be inspired by in here. it's it's dolphy though um yeah. but so i'm gonna play the co little chorus and then i want to talk about his analysis real quick because yeah. to oh, me this george is george russell's it, analysis yes oh no all right so eric dolphy Okay, <laughs> after we listen to that, I have one quick thing to point out. Yes. And we made fun of the last one for its production, the last clip we played. Dude, what universe do we live in where the sax is panned to the right and the sax's reverb is on my left? What fucking world do I, we live in? I hate jazz. I hate jazz. <laughs> do, do, uh, am I wrong in thinking that's bad? Is that Oh, just, no, that sounded like shit. Yeah, I, I wanted to show... It's like... Why is this reverb trail on the other side? Is this like a giant cathedral that's only well, on yeah, one side? Yeah, it's like you're singing them live. <laughs> so, like, he's playing over here on the right, but the, the reflection is only on, on the left. left. Yeah, right. exactly. So, anyway, a brief from that aside. Um, so, a bunch of crazy shit going on. It's Eric Dolphy. Yeah. I don't know. Like, I can't get behind his brain, honestly. Who yeah, knows? Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I think I heard some. I guess stronger resolution in there, but I guess that's my Western theory brain talking. Yeah, there, there are pretty clear like uh, there's a pretty clear moment where it's like A minor D seven, A flat minor D five right. seven. Right. So I think it's I mean the chords are pretty standard, and George Russell used more standard progressions as well. Yeah, yeah. I think it's more like what's Dolphy's thinking mm -hmm. uh, as he scale wise. Way, yeah. um, but well, I just wanted to point out one thing because this to me is where the George, the fucking George Russell thing is just too ridiculous. A disaster. All right, okay. let's hear it. So essentially, this is like uh, an F blues. Yep. Um, so I'm just gonna look at one bar here. So on the fourth measure, uh, George says he does a G flat minor seven to a B seven going into B flat seven. Yep. Okay. So Dolphy plays kind of a weird line. I'm just kind of looking at it right now. It looks sort of like he does like F minor pentatonic on the G flat. So bluesy thing, and then he sort of does like a B triad into a C triad, and then resolving into the B flat. So my quick analysis of sort of what he's thinking there, I don't know, but yeah. that's essentially what he's playing. A little bluesy thing, B to C. Yeah. Just kind of thinking triads. Sure. As what I see. 
how George. That's because you have a small brain. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, how George. Puts big, it. big brain Russell. On bar four, he actually does a bar by bar analysis of this. Bar four. The two chords of bar four represent PMG six and two of the A Lydian chromatic scale. Eric's improvised melody employs secondary modal genre to expand the tonal environment of the A Lydian chromatic scale. The parent Lydian chromatic scale for both chords of bar four. Again, he states an A flat Lydian augmented scale SMG fragment, this time over the G flat minor seven chord. All the notes of the melody sounding over the first five eighth notes of bar four within the ten tone order of the A Lydian chromatic scale. Over the remainder of that bar, Dolphy's melody sounds an F Lydian SMG fragment in a manner that shows how alternate parent scales can exist and be exploited within the general class of SMG. Um, I hate to break it to you. I listened to approximately three words of that. I mean, I don't, I didn't listen to any. I was just, just I, don't, <laughs> I don't understand it. I mean, like, Whew. I, you know, like, so his, his, his analysis compared to mine, which I'm not saying mine is right, but yeah. like this first little fragment, which to me is just kind of F, blues kind of shit sure. he thinks comes from the a flat lydian augmented scale which it'd be well because it's a g flat minor so and then he goes to the b7 where he's playing a lydian which sure. okay fine you i can, guess that you works can think of it that yeah way. and then but he does a little c7 or c arpeggio at the end which mm-hmm. he would then say goes to f lydian over the b7 and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Like, he's he's um got a case of running too far. I'd say yeah, the first fifty pages of this book are solid. I agree. And then I, it's I, just I, a bunch yeah. of this shit. I really liked <laughs> I really liked the first fifty pages mm-hmm. a lot. And I actually would recommend it to anyone who's looking to get in some uh, some nerd shit. Yeah, I actually saw a cool thing on some guitar book where <laughs> I know, right? This one's actually good, I swear. Uh, uh, but there's like I know, I love the guitar like, grimoire, dude. Oh my god, shut up. <laughs> um, talk about like pattern exercises and stuff. Sure. And it's like, you know, say you're just like one three five or whatever. So do that on like modally or do that, whatever. And then he's like, do it for like Lydian chromatic. So like you're always playing one three five, but it'd always be like a Lydian thing over every chord or something like that. So it's like, yeah, you can play around with this stuff. And I think it's an interesting way to think about things for sure. Sure. But not whatever the fuck smg secondary modal something i think uh secondary modal group something like that i think he gets so many fucking acronyms in this book yeah secondary modal gyration genre maybe i don't fucking know but yeah that's um that's about all i gotta say about george russell i don't know if you got anything like in conclusion george russell no (laughs) not even once not even once actually that's not true I like He them. makes some really good music. Yeah. I highly L- recommend Listen George to Russell. his tunes, read the first two chapters. Two chapters, maybe three, I, think. I can't remember. Two yeah. chapters is enough to keep okay. going, I think. <laughs> and then after you read the first two chapters, you'll be like, you know, that's pretty cool. I don't know, man. Maybe Coltrane was thinking Lydian diminished on that G7. We're going to move on now. <laughs> so we're going chronologically, I guess. Yeah. Uh, through our four super jazz nerds. I believe that was probably the most extensive one we're going to touch upon. because I sure the, hope so. It's been like fucking 30 uh, minutes. Dude. Well, that's what has the most shit. In it, and it's probably yeah. the most influential of anything we're that's talking about. True. We're I getting a little so. more niche here after this. Actually, I think these also go in order of esotericness. Yeah, I guess they do. <laughs> well, okay. Who's after this again? Well, now we're talking about Mr. Ornette Coleman. That's, okay. It does go in order of esotericness. <laughs> Specifically, we're talking about his concept of harmelotics. Mm-hmm. He's bad at names. Yeah. Well, dude, what genre does he play again? <laughs> I forget. Did he play jazz? Well, kind of. <laughs> well, actually, he's uh, really good at jazz. He's <laughs> really great at jazz. Harmelotics actually came much later in his career, mm-hmm. uh, late seventies, and so harmelotics is one of those things where he's never actually really defined it very well. <laughs> There's one, he apparently was going, was going to write a book. He's dead now, so it's never going to happen. Right. Uh, but he did, he gave it a little like preview or like intro essay or something like that. And that's about what we're going to get for harm melodics. But essentially, the idea is the harmony and the melody and the rhythm, which I guess he couldn't fit in the name. Uh, <laughs> well, it's kind of a shitty word for yeah, that. Yeah. Are all equal. Makes sense to me. That is harm a lot. <laughs> yeah. So in practice, what that ended up being was that, I mean, I this I shit, I love this shit, yeah. that anyone could essentially do anything, shift any harmony, any melody, any fucking rhythm, groove in the middle of a song. And the idea was you'd all improvise along with it or against it. And that was the composition. You might have a head and then it's sort of 
let's go into a Latin thing here. Let's sure. go into rock. And he was really like mixing genres a lot at yeah. this time, which I think is awesome. And obviously that's something like you and I do a lot. Yeah, so, yeah. um, and uh, I guess what I would say is Ornette Coleman, when you hear this description of his harmonics, you can literally just see all of his music fly in front of you. Yeah. You can, uh, this is how he was thinking 100% of the time. 100%. And, and it's so cool. Yeah. It is really cool. And the thing that I find kind of interesting is that it's almost kind of inside. I mean, it's like everyone's sort of playing inside, but, but combined it comes yeah. out. Yeah. And it's really cool. Um, I was going to play a little bit here off of Virgin Beauty. Oh. This feature is Jerry Garcia on guitar. It does not. It does. I love the dead, man. <laughs> this is called Three Wishes. And let's listen to those har melodics. <laughs> Yeah, fuck bass uh, hey. uh, <laughs> So it's weird. It it's weird. Very uh, very cyclical. Very repetitive. Until and honestly, it works. This is why it works for me being this cyclical and repetitive. Because when it breaks that cycle and goes into that two bar little mm -hmm. uh, uh, interlude, I guess you yeah. call it. Um, it it breaks it up so well. In those two bars, you hear the whole concept exactly, of melodics. Exactly to the to its pinnacle and it's really compelling to my ears well now it's interesting like the music he's writing at this time it is very like kind of droney and yeah. static ostinato esque yeah, yeah. yeah. and but you notice little things like after the first two bar little interlude then the drum started just kind of playing this sort of weird pattern yeah yeah uh, off kilter yeah. yeah and so it's like okay it's slowly starting to to morph save a bar, you know um and i think you know live especially he would get a lot more free with that and a lot quicker stuff. yeah but even then there would be a lot of times where the band would continue or just the bass and guitar would continue that kind of sure. groove and they'd all go on their own shit that guitar did one really fucking sweet thing when he altered it up and played like this giant um we're in i think it's, it's an f ish f major <laughs> f minor blah blah blah, all that kind of shit is it f lydian it's f lydian <laughs> auxiliary <laughs> oh uh, and, no, so uh there's one part where the guitar player just literally played like ascending power chords yeah, for like yeah. five no just like two seconds mm -hmm. and it was so good Ah, it's cool it's, it's a like, cool concept it is it's dense but also it's grounded enough i feel yeah, like yeah and it's very intuitive too mm -hmm. uh as a musician i would say oh yeah that is the thing to, to people who are not awful <laughs> <laughs> We're, oh, i'm gonna talk about that at the end of the uh, segment. But. yeah there was actually something in his essay where he talked about like auditioning a bass player for this group mm -hmm. and um the bass player was like, I don't think I can play your tunes. And or I was like, no, I just want you to play, man. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and then, like, but that kind of is it. So it's not necessarily like, it's more about having musicality and being able to mm -hmm. improvise and listen as opposed to anything, like nothing in there is hard to play. No. Uh, well, technically, <laughs> with like, the exception of that fucking trumpet player <laughs> hitting the fucking high C over and over and over. Like, I got this guy. <laughs> 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 like, fucking killing it bro <laughs> but no that's not technically that uh, hard either so anyway yeah yeah but it's um 
Now, the only other person I know who actually used this concept as well was James Blood Ulmer. So mm. I don't know if you're familiar <laughs> with him. I've, I've heard the name once. Uh, he's a Probably guitarist. I would consider him like a blues guitarist. Um, he studied, played with Ornette, studied with Ornette, and he's played with a bunch of people. But um, he says he uses harmonics in his playing. Okay. To me, it sounds like blues. Like weird. Well, okay, but if you like, take the concept of harmonics, mm, you <laughs> <laughs> okay? You combine harmonics with the Lydian chromatic. Ah, <laughs> George Russell. No. <laughs> um, I mean, it is weird blues. It's like it's weird, like modern free jazz delta. I guess I would describe yeah, it. Okay. It's cool. I mean, it's not like that out there, but it's like a lot of it's just him singing and electric guitar, and he's yeah. kind of playing some weird shit. Mm-hmm. He always has a chorus on his guitar. I don't know what the fuck's that about. Chorus guitar, uh, awesome. Anyway, um, but he did write a album. He wrote a piece or two that went on the album, Harmonic Guitar with Strings. What a name, dude! What so, genre is he playing? Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna we're gonna play just a little expert from the excerpt from this. Um I don't really know how this falls into harmonics, but it's in the title, so it must. Yeah, I'm gonna try my best to figure it out. Okay, here I'm we on, go. I'm on the case. This is Arena Church. Nice. I, I guess the term mixed feelings has like a negative connotation, but like I have mixed feelings in like kind of a good way, I guess. Sure. I can almost hear what he means by harmonics in literally only his playing. Yes, <laughs> that is it. Everything else is ultra captain standard, man, you know, right. E minor uh, string trio bullshit. Um, and obviously it's composed, which obviously to me, yeah. harmonics means more improvisation, but I mean, there's heads and things, yeah, I guess, so it's, it's hard to parse exactly what he means, but yeah. I can definitely hear him, pl- him playing with the mindset required for harmonics, but like, yes. the mindset required for harmonics is literally just like, play what you want. Play what you want, with again, within reason, and also with good musical sense, which I, I, I heard from him. I think so, too. I mean, I don't... The, I'm not gonna lie, the chorus actually did hurt my butt a little bit. Yeah, right? It's I, weird I, in this I, setting. It's <laughs> weird in this setting. You have a very nice string sound. Yeah. You got the string trio, and then he comes and it's like... Mow, 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 yeah. Big right. dance chorus. Anyway, yeah, that's yeah, just a yeah. sign. I'm just taking time out to say that every clip we've played so far is just when I was making fun of production for 12, tw- <laughs> 12 seconds after... Why is everyone so bad about it? <laughs> you should take me. a page from the killers that's some good production. oh god yeah. everyone go listen to our episode number 27 good bad and the ugly number two yes. <laughs> anyway uh so i guess harmonics is whatever you want it to mean uh, in a sense. Pretty i mean mu- that's the thing it's not really a thing it's not it's not it, it's, yeah it's literally just and i think this is an important thing to note especially as far as like improvising more freely is mm-hmm. concerned is that it's more about your mindset than anything and harmonics is almost like how I would perceive it is like an instruction booklet for a musician to think in context of an overall musical picture. Sure. But using going as far out as you can while maintaining some sort of coherence mm-hmm. in your comp- composition, quote unquote, 
Yeah. But like your improvisation in a group. And I feel like that's the more important thing to take away is that it's just a mindset based thing. I think so. I mean, I'm sure Ornette was tired of all the flack getting he's like, you're not actually playing music. You're just blowing random notes in your <laughs> horn. And so maybe this is sort of like backlash against I mean, like, look, we're composing yeah. on the spot here. Yeah. Like, and you and know, I, I agree with that concept. I he, do too. He is, yeah. he is composing mm-hmm. on the spot. And you're right. That could be just be like a, huh, you guys just fucking don't get it yet, which they didn't for they a did while. Yeah. Yeah. Coleman was ahead of his time. He was. He really was. So um, it could be. You're right. Yeah. I don't know. But that's harmonics for you. Yeah. I, I'm a fan. I like uh, it. Again, it's not really a thing in and of itself. No, but, but the concepts, I think, is very influential. It's stuff. Like yeah, Chris they said. lend itself well. And I feel like. Especially these days, a lot more like adventurous, proggy kind of bands definitely do this yeah, thing a lot. Either so. they do it or they need to do it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's put it that way. Yes. All right. Should we move on? I think we should. We're going to start talking about a uh, saxophone slash flutist slash composer slash theorist named Henry Threadgill. The Threadmaster. Oh, <laughs> weaving those threads up and down his tunes. Henry Threadgill, a uh, very interesting person. Yeah. <laughs> I would say uh, what we're going to talk about with Henry Threadgill is specifically the way he uses this is like I guess uh, if you wanted to call it pitch class sets if you wanted to call it just intervallic writing if you want there's a whole bunch of names you could attribute to yeah. it basically he has, it takes a couple different forms but like the main one is you give X person in the band three intervals you give X person in the band you like the bass player or whatever nine intervals and then you end up with twelve total notes or you end up in some sort of, yeah. he described himself. I think, uh, I read an interview in like jazz times or something where he describes himself as a post serialist. Yes. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a good way to describe it. Serialism, of course, where you order all 12 tones in order and he has like a, he kind of crunches it up and demides it among people. And then the, and the idea really is more improvising around that yeah. too. Um, I think so. I mean, yeah, there's actually not a lot written about this. Like there's interviews with him. Yeah, that's it. But there's, there's, there's nothing, no, there's no treatises. There's it. no books. Um, I first came across this when I was studying with Tom Baker. Mm-hmm. Check him out. Tom badass, Baker's awesome. Yeah. Badass composer and guitar player. And he had studied with the guitar player in Henry Fegel's band. Uh, what is it? Liberty Elman. <laughs> and Liberty explained this concept to Tom. And so the idea was that or initially anyway, it's, it's called interval scales. Mm-hmm. And so if you have a chord, let's just say you have a C major chord. C lady and chord. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. So if we take our C major chord, we have three notes, C, E, and G. Okay. So C to E is a major third. C to G is a fifth. And then E to G is a minor third. So you mm-hmm. have three intervals right there. Minor third, major third, perfect fifth. Sure. Then you also have the inversions of each of those intervals. So now we also have minor six, major six, and the fourth. So the interval scale for a c major chord or actually any major chord would be the same because mm-hmm. keys don't matter here but minor third major third fourth fifth minor six major six yeah okay so now if i'm playing that c chord you have to improvise whatever notes you want but every note has to go to one of those intervals yeah. next exactly so you're not thinking keys you're not thinking notes really at all you're literally thinking you're calculating you're yeah. calculating um yeah i think it was the same interview where he said when he was first doing this concept with his band, they spent a year just fucking hashing yep, it yep. out. That's his, that is <laughs> like, that They didn't even play live. They were literally just in there for a year. Dude, that's some fucking Captain Beefheart it shit. It is, man. but I, I mean... Lock him in a cabin. I mean, we've tried this before. It's really fucking yeah, hard yeah, yeah. to do. We, we've tried. We, we tried it. I made my best effort, but I just... I couldn't make... I couldn't make the concept work. Again, they practice it for a year. I practice it for 10 seconds. But like... It's a very difficult concept to organize in your mind. Yes. Uh, possibly because it's just so contrary to how you would normally think. and Because it's it's too far beyond, uh, I guess, our jazz, you know, ter- yeah. or uh, tetrachord kind of mm-hmm. chord scale mm-hmm. theory harmony. Just to think in raw intervals and then still shape around a chord and shape around a good contour of your melody yeah. and get harmonics out of it. <laughs> but that is the thing it's like even more like kind of advanced jazz when you're dealing with maybe not standard chords so yeah. some more like kind of out there dense chromatic kind of chords i still think you can sort of like jazz that and come up with a scale or a set of notes that yeah work absolutely. There's, that. Still, there's still a concept of uh, like a horizontal movement voice leading yeah exactly whereas when, when you start talking about interval scales and how they get derived and bullshit then you start i feel like you start losing your ability when you're playing to think horizontally long term and think you have to start thinking more 
vertically and just mm-hmm. like literally one almost one note at a time well and that's the thing too it's like one thing like let's sit on a c chord for like 10 measures and see what happens but what if every bar is a different interval scale yeah so and they are and they are yeah and obviously you're going to have crossover in some of the intervals but like to be able to think that fast yeah. in the moment it's a new language you have to it is. spend years yes and so his i mean and that was his point he's like i'm tired of people improvising over scales sure. and chords like and that's you, cool you can't think what you like you can't <laughs> think about this you like no. everything you've ever known doesn't work anymore yeah yeah, yeah. it's fucking crazy <laughs> like, it's fucking crazy like, it, it it's really cool and um I've, I listened to a good amount of Thready, Thread me, Thread Hengill, <laughs> Thready Hengill this week. Thready boy. <laughs> Thready boy, my dude, Henry Threadgill. I listened to a good chunk of him this week. And again, it's just one of those things. We're going to keep revisiting this, but when you make theoretical concepts like this, they create a very unique sound. Mm-hmm. Uh, their application beyond that sound is very, very limited. I think uh, so. Uh, potentially zero. So, I, <laughs> and that's, but to me, the fact that the sound is so unique from Henry's compositions yes. and his albums is so much justification for this kind of style. The poor musicians in that band must hate him. And uh, on that note, I want to say real quick that there are like brief stories here and there. I think it's also in that same Jazz Times interview where he mentions that every time someone would play not an interval in the interval scale, he would know. He can hear it. He would know instantly. It's and insane. So that's why Henry Threadgill is both A, a genius. And be a fucking huge douche asshole motherfucker. I mean, he has a vision. I mean, yeah, I guess it's sort of like the George Russell thing where it's like you take that concept and you you (laughs) fucking run it. (laughs) Well, the the idea is to try to push it to its logical uh, conclusion, right? So, Well, I think this kind of interesting here with the thread go versus like the George Russell is that if you're doing the fucking interval skill thing, that has to be 100% committed. Yeah, there's no way. You have to because anytime you break out of that, the whole thing just falls apart. It only works because everyone is purely thinking intervality. Yeah. And interestingly, uh, I don't know. I don't remember how he thinks about this, but like inverting the intervals. So so in the interval scale, you're like, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, major six, minus six, fifth, all that shit. I don't think inverting the the minor seconds works in his intervals. Oh, really? Going downwards because that's a major seventh. Mm -hmm. I don't think that works in his... I don't remember how it works. Okay, I don't know that. But the the idea being that he moves him to his logical conclusion in that if you're going to commit, you're going to commit 100%. You can't go downwards a major second. You can only go Mm -hmm. up a major second and then down a minor sixth or whatever else is in your specific interval scale. (gasps) Well, should we listen? Let's listen to a little bit. And again, before you listen to it, I think I think it's worthy just because of the sound it creates is very different. I actually like, we're gonna play this record. I love this record. Yeah, I think it's, it's awesome. Dope. It doesn't sound like anything else. No, and also Henry Threadgill not only is a composer and theorist, that dude can play, man. Oh yeah, shit. that dude can play, <laughs> dude. I mean, he's also on like a bunch of albums, just yeah, playing dude, like normal shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, normal. Yeah, but. yeah. Well, believe it or not, he can play in jazz uh, standard harmony. That's yeah. true. So we're gonna listen to "In for a Penny, In for a Pound." The <sighs> first I track. Jazz, I hate jazz. I hate jazz. I hate jazz. I hate jazz. Uh, I would like to point out that he won a Pulitzer Prize for this album, mm-hmm. but so did Kendrick Lamar. So I guess that doesn't matter. <laughs> All right, here we go. <laughs> I think, uh, real quick, I think, first of all, the production is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a Pulitzer Prize winning That's fucking right. album. <laughs> but if you've noticed um, the flute lines, I, I'm kind of just trying to justify yeah. me remembering shit. I th- the flute lines generally always resolved upwards hmm. and never went back down. So that's kind of like further justification in my head. But then the two was bouncing around. This would be a great thing to have the score of. Yeah, I'm sure that would answer some questions. But yeah. the thing is, it's like... a. This is mostly improvised. Yeah, so you there's gotta, no score available unless someone is a yeah. huge weirdo and put it on Scrib to you or oh, whatever you Jesus call that. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Could you? Well, that's, I was thinking about that when I was writing. It's like, theoretically, someone could sit down and compose that 
Theoretically, they could. I, I guess, yeah, that's I true. I mean, or at least if you take it instrument by instrument or something. You yeah, know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah, sure. theoretically, nothing is like, oh my God, what did yeah, you just play? That's right. There's nothing super insanely uh, either A, virtuosic, or B, super yeah, innovative. Yeah, I mean, it does kind of sound like serialism or something does, like yeah. that, and it's that way. You, you, could play, um, you could place this among 1920s yeah, composers. Especially yeah. like instrument by instrument. But the fact that they're all improvising this within some sort of structure, again, I don't know what the fuck yeah. this pr- particular piece looks like, but. Yeah. It yeah, comes yes, out with yeah. that, but to me, and I'm not going to pretend I can hear the intervals they're playing <laughs> <laughs> or anything like that. But to me, there is you could I do hear some sort of a unity. There's among, structure there's, somewhere. There is, and it, like specifically, it's like intervals do have flavor to them, yep. right? And so you can kind of hear these flavor changing as it progresses when like bigger ones or smaller ones or more dissonant, more open ones kind of come in and out. Again, it's like super subtle. I mean, we could probably sit down and figure it out, but fuck that. That'd be a nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> but to me, it, like, I do believe that, yeah, he's doing it. He's literally writing music like this, and it works. It works, yeah. Uh, again, works meaning from our <laughs> weird fucking... I mean, I think it's fucking I, bad. <laughs> I think it's fucking amazing yeah. and awesome. But like, I'm not going to show this to my mom, right? <laughs> <laughs> or whatever, right? But like... uh I wanted to say part of the reason I think I would just like to point out that your mom thought "Creep" by Radiohead was weird. So that's true. So that's where this conversation—that's <laughs> what I mean. So, uh, but I wanted to point out that the instrumentation of this album is very interesting as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what is it? Fiddle, tuba, flute, um, Gu- flute sax, whatever he does, all that shit. Guitar. And then there's two more guitar and clean, clean electric. Yeah, really very weird. clean, kind of weird right. tone or that. Yeah. yeah, and then drums. And then drums. Yeah. So. Very interesting instrumentation, and I'm trying to figure out how to relate that to his concept in my head. I guess that if you used an acoustic bass, A, it wouldn't be quite as present, and Mm -hmm. the fat like attack you get from a tuba is easier to identify his scales with, maybe. Maybe he just likes the sound. Maybe he just likes the sound. Apparently, this guy also plays trombone on it, so he does, yeah. Presumably, he tracks without tuba, or at least he's switching at some point. Um, I mean, and this is actually, we should point out, this is a particular band called Zuid. Yep. And that's sort of where he does all his, this kind of writing is in Zuid. So, you know, maybe he was just trying to break down the whole jazz thing even more by using less traditional instruments. Sure. Although the tube, no, 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 no. Not that traditional. (laughs) Oh, that's Uh, as traditional as you get. Uh, I do remember something, too. I was thinking when we were listening to this, um, Tom Baker mentioned something about the drums having something to do with the intervals as well. I have no fucking clue how that works. I would have to listen again for sure to yeah, figure it out. I don't know if it's like he would have to retune like, his toms. No, like, I think it's more like rhythmically, like quarter oh, notes and eighth notes only versus oh. something like that. I don't know how that works at all. That would be interesting. Well, in theory, that would just be like a one to one correlation, just mathematically. And that might be it. I don't. Yeah. I just don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, that's usually how these kind of esoteric mm-hmm. uh, theory things kind of work. Is that yeah. you just translate it over rhythmically as a part of yeah. And uh, we're actually going to talk about that when you get to Steve Lehman as well. But the, when you take something like this and you have to put it to something that doesn't make actual fucking pitches, then you generally take the simplest option sure. and put it there. Yeah, it might be that. I don't know. It could but, be. Um, well, I guess we'll start our transcription and we'll report back. Uh, that's going to be, you know... Some of these songs are like 20 minutes long. Could you imagine? Uh, that's, that's a yikes for me, dude. Uh, I would also like to point out that like none of his music on Spotify... Uh, <laughs> which is fine, which I'm all for. Yeah. But so they run Bandcamp and to buy the digital album. Oh, I know. $18 to download this digital album. Oh, my God. And you can't even listen to all the songs of Bandcamp. No, only listen, two. You can only listen to two. Yeah. The and act, it's like the shortest ones, too, right? The actual CD is $20. So I'm like, <laughs> uh, I don't know. I mean, again, don't actually care. The pricing. I think it's funny. (laughs) It's hilarious. The music pricing point for everyone is different because music is a shitty industry now. I mean, I guess if you're a fucking Pulitzer Prize winner. That's right, dude. I'm spending like 40. Do you know when that Pulitzer happened? Uh, I think it was 2016. 2016, okay. Something like that, yeah. Yeah. Very very recent is the point. $30 for damn. Is it $30 for damn? Okay. <laughs> you get the price bump when you win a poll. Oh, that's right. That's right. That's right. Oh, that's right. Because jazz albums are like fucking free now. <laughs> hey. No. So, uh, Pulitzer Prize winner, Bandcamp. Yeah. So, Bandcamp is an interesting choice for Mr. Threadgill. I mean, he's, what label is he on? He's on. Uh, he's on Pi. Pi. Yeah. yeah. I love Pi. Pi is one of the best labels there is today. Yeah. Like, yeah, at least for 
this jazz shit. shit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Jersey's um, for weird jazz shit. And like, I think Rebus uh, is on there. Yep, yeah. The Jay is on there. And Steve. Steve will be uh, on. Yep, Steve's uh, on there. Yep, yep, there you go. So, um, but yeah, that's that's Thread Guild. Check them out. You know, there's not a lot out there, really, but like... You won't find anything quite like it. You will not. If you're interested in discovering a new Sonic territory, mm-hmm. you'll never go back after... <laughs> <laughs> I only play intervals. Yeah, that's right. No. Yeah, dude. I was sitting in the fucking jam session, dude. See, the problem is I only play rock, so everything's a power chord, so it's only two intervals on every song. <laughs> <laughs> a fifth and a fourth? Is that, is that <laughs> okay. And the second, actually, so it's three. Oh, good call. Uh-huh. So I just run whole tone up every... Of course. <laughs> well, li- no, Lydian... Ah, Lydian what? auxiliary, auxiliary augmented. augmented. That's it. <laughs> Literary and auxiliary augmented. Fucking George Russell. I know. George Russell, no! <laughs> <laughs> All right, on to our last weirdo of the day, I that's, guess. That's right. Today we have Mr. Steve Lehman. More like lame. Good one. Yeah. Oh, okay. That joke was no, not like brought Steve to its logic. I know. He's fucking dude. awesome. Steve Lehman is at least top two saxophonists right now for me. Yep. With Chris Potter as number one. <laughs> that was, in case you viewers at home are not watching our YouTube video, that was extremely obvious sarcasm. I hate Chris Potter a lot. But Steve Lehman is fucking awesome. And we're specifically going to talk about like two to three Steve Lehman songs slash an entire album, kind of. So Steve Lehman, alto sax player, composer, theorist, all that shit. Very, very good at all those things. <laughs> he is insanely good at He's playing so music. He's so good, man. I, like, yeah, that's a, that's just a good way to put it. He's very good at music. Yeah. He does everything well. You can hear him. Uh, he has a great record with Rude Resh from Hantaba called Dual Identity. Yeah. That I don't want to say that's more straight ahead. More than it, this. More than this. Uh. <laughs> Today, we're going to talk about a, comp, or a, uh, a style or a theory or whatever you want to call it called spectrographing or <laughs> spectral music. I'm going to leave now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> like this, and basically this, what it means... too far. <laughs> yeah, basically what it means is that it's, you know, you get some ghosts in... Ah, oh, fuck. Oh. Yeah, you see what spectre, I did there? Spectre, I spectre, see. Yeah, I'm so mm-hmm. fucking funny. Okay. <laughs> uh, spectrographing or spectral music is where you identify the overtone series of a specific note, and I'll get to what specific notes in a second, but when you identify the specific notes and then base an entire composition around those notes and intervals, the idea really being that in an overtone series on a specific note, you're going to get things that have certain scent deviations, right? So when you start getting towards the upper end of your overtone series, you're going to get like minus 12, minus 34 cents, uh, plus 12, blah, 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 cents. So you end up with chords that are a, a fucking nightmare to play yeah. Get fucked, piano. <laughs> yeah, well, well, I'll talk about that in a minute. But because uh, it's one of those almost like George Russell things where he kind of cheats to fit this kind of thing in. Yeah. I'm going to talk about that. But uh, like playing microtones is a nightmare on any instrument. Uh, I played some microtonal stuff on trombone back in the day and I wanted to kill myself. But the idea really being that you end up with these chord shapes that are not possible otherwise. And these chord shapes being influenced by these overtone series. So you have, uh, you have your root and then you have like, even like a perfect fifth mm-hmm. and all this kind of shit. And then you end up with, uh, I think it's the 13th note in the interval or the overtone series where you end up with the sharp four, the George Russell. <laughs> is this the advanced Lydian chromatic concept? <laughs> this is advanced Whoa. Lydian microtonal concept of tonal organization. <laughs> microtonal organization. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh my god but george yeah. save me george <laughs> save me george from steve layman so steve layman basically microtones based on the overtone series of a specific instrument's note and i guess i kind of just want to start off by playing a piece off of the album i can never remember these three words in order travail transformation and flow why i know jazz it's like every fucking jazz time. albums every fucking Why? time can you name <laughs> something not stupid please please I'm sure it has some deep meaning to him and um, yeah. we're stupid, but like the piece is called Echos, E-C-H-O-S. Well, at least that's normal. Yeah, well, relatively yeah. speaking. But uh, t- pay attention to kind of the, if you think it's out of tune, then you're right. No, <laughs> but if you're going to hear a lot of microtones, but more importantly, you're going to kind of hear how he makes it work compositionally, I think. And let's play it up.
Whoa. <laughs> so, first of all, uh, I am way an enormous fan of this album. Man, in- if anyone ever tells me to tune my guitar again, I'm just going to be like, well, Steve Lehman would. <laughs> yeah, dude. <laughs> no, uh, so... Here's a reason I really respect his attempt at spectru- spectral music or spectrographing is because he makes it work on a compositional level. Yes. Um, what I mean by that really on a compositional level means he employs concepts of, I guess, tension and release and r- resolution even. And all these different concepts kind of align to make this piece mm-hmm. really, really work for me. I think it's very compelling listening. Yeah. Um, I don't want to say even from like, uh, a layman's perspective. I don't know. Okay. Ah! Okay. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Sorry, I had to. But uh, I think this is very compelling listening on every level, not just uh, uh, theoretical, esoteric. I guess having the context for that makes it even more exciting. Sure. Yes. But uh, that's something I want to talk about later. Don't let me forget. But this just works everywhere. For instance. Uh, I'll talk about the exact theoretical principles of this later, but even the way he like switches roots at the right time and the polyrhythms intersecting over each other. And then they all drop together on like the root change. Mm-hmm. And then that creates this whole thing. And then it's even almost like a, so this piece, okay, I'll just talk in roots. The root isn't the first root is E and then C. And then it does that kind of, kind of same thing over again. But later he does E C D. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. D ish. But I can't remember where that is in the overtone series. It's like plus six or something. Plus six cents. But like, even that's reminiscent of your E minor C D. Yeah. It's a very strong movement. It does. It does kind of have that structure. I don't want to say, but like you can hear, you can hear the head almost. You can. Yes. Yeah. 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 In a manner of speaking. Well, it's kind of interesting compared to like, say thread goal. And obviously they're working on two extremely opposite levels here. Right. But like the thread goal shit is sort of like you're dropped into a bunch of random shit. Here, it does sound more like a song. I almost would compare it to, like, electronic music. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say that. Yeah, know? it's very um, grounded, very mm-hmm, structural, mm-hmm. very cool. Especially dealing more, like, I think it's, like, a byproduct of the overtone thinking, but it's almost more timbral in a way. Yeah. You know, it's yeah, not it's so much about the, I mean, it is about the very notes. Very texture. Yeah. yeah, it's very textural, though. Um, I would like to also point out and appreciate how he's using those like really cool sort of like modern hip hop drum beats oh, yeah. <laughs> way before all these fucking Adam Neely assholes were doing it to be like hip hop jazz is cool. <laughs> yeah, no, Steve Lehman is like one of my favorite musicians and composers alive today. Um, but I kind of want to start, a, I, kinda, I guess I kind of want to go into now what the spectrographing actually means in regards yeah, to this good. composition. So with this piece, Echoes, Everything is based around the fundamental pitch of a vibraphone playing four octaves below where it can actually play, or three octaves, I can't remember. So it's based on the E1 frequency of a vibraphone that it doesn't actually have on a vibraphone. And every single instrument is assigned certain overtones at certain times of that, including the drums, which is why, remember when I mentioned that we're going to talk about how you introduce rhythm into these kind of theories? Here we go. So (laughs) the tuba... Oh, wow, the tuba. <laughs> That's the uh, Thren Guild. My You're bad. The electric here. bass. <laughs> yes. The okay. electric bass, a very good instrument, is playing the second of the overtone series, which is an octave above, right? Okay. And then you have your, the vibraphone's playing like the 11th and 16th of its overtone series, approximately. Mm-hmm. And all these have to be somewhat approximate because musicians are not actually capable of playing. Oh, there's no way. Yeah, so it's, that not, it's not possible. Yeah, yeah. It's, so... And then you have the alto sax playing the eighth font or the eighth overtone and then blah, blah, blah. But the drums change their meter based on the overtone series as well. Mm. So in, for instance, in you hear different polyrhythms here and there, those are based on the fifth, eighth and ninth mm. intervals of or, or overtones of the scale. And again, that literally just translates to polyrhythm of sure. you're in seven of seven, four, and then the polyrhythms of five. Got it. Over okay. that. So it's very much just a mathematical shove it into the drums any way you can. But as a concept for composition, I think it works completely. I think so too. And it's like you are saying earlier, he's very, I mean, I actually think all of the people that we've listened to today share this quality too, but very compositionally minded. Yeah. And the fact that you can't be blowing yeah. some random ass blah, 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 <laughs> over that because yeah. then it's just all it's garbage it's garbage yeah. it's, you can't yeah. fucking get anything out of it. and that. that's why like 
you have to be an incredible musician to play free jazz and different like weird ass music mm-hmm. like this. Well, it's interesting too because like I mean, you and I have heard him play and like live and on you mm-hmm. know, like the rude red shit and it's yeah. like dude can obviously just fucking shred mm-hmm. and like do all the shit in any style. He doesn't so much do it on this because it's not really about that. that. Well, it's, this is his vision is for yeah. this world where he does end up shredding on this track. Yeah, so I know and he it, does do that, but like it's it, not really no, it's about v- that. It's you very know? specific too, mm-hmm. and I'm gonna get into that in like five seconds. So one of the things that really uh, puzzled me about this kind of music is. How does Steve Lehman take a solo over it? Because you can you can hear him shredding. It's again pretty hard to identify what exactly he's doing and mm-hmm. how it's any different from like free jazz soloing sure. in general. But once you kind of get the context of what he's doing, and you and I'll explain how to do that in a second, you can really you can you can hear it. I think. And basically, what I'm about to go into, I'm going to make you play the solo. I think it starts at like one thirty-five or so. The idea is. That you only play, <laughs> uh, he notates it on his score as H's 8 through 16, where the H is a specific note in the overtone series of the f- root that's in question. Okay. So, for instance, over the vibraphone root E, you have the 8th through 16th overtone scale rounded to a quarter note, or, mm-hmm. wow, uh, sorry, a quarter step. Okay. And that's your scale. That's your interval scale. I was about to say, what a... Kind of crazy way to like, it's, uh-huh. oh, it's like the same idea, but totally different. But totally different. Sorry. <laughs> well, I'm having puns. It's Jake's comedy hour over That's here. That's right. Puns for days. So I want to play a bit of the solo and hopefully I got the right timestamp because I literally forgot it. Well, we're going to see what happens. If we hear Steve Lehman go, Boom! then it'll be good. Oh. So that, that's the start of like the brief interlude section. And uh, I want to point out that this piece is very structural. It's the it's the head, quote unquote. And then it's the same thing, repetition, but with Steve Lehman soloing mm-hmm. over it. And then it's a little interlude. And then they uh, Steve Lehman calls it a drum coda, where it's little segments of the melody combined with drum, big fat drum mm-hmm. fills, huge improv. And it's and that's how it ends. And it's really cool. All in four and a half minutes. All in four and a half minutes. That's This piece is not long. It's like, I think it's close to five. And... It's really, it's a tight composition. It is. Everything's accounted for. Well, that's what I was saying. It reminds you of like electronic or pop, ugh, yeah. you know, but like standard music in a way. And especially like in its own repeated way. listening and then hearing the chord, the chord yeah. changes or the root changes. Or yeah. Like, yeah. Know, like, and uh, again, I want to reiterate that all those uh, weird. Uh, so the trombone, vibraphone, bass or yeah, electric bass. Like, why do I keep going back to tuba? Uh, <laughs> Henry Threadgill. No. <laughs> <laughs> all these instruments it's the steve Lehman octet if i'm not mistaken yeah mm-hmm. so all these instruments are playing specific spectrographical mm-hmm. uh, readings and as close as they can on that instrument to the fundamental that is yeah. being played or being theorized you know and i will say too just in general obviously he's not the first person to experiment with like microtonal music right um I just find his compositions very inviting into that world where yeah. it's like after the initial sort of getting your ears adjusted, it's, it sounds really good. It sounds like, awesome. You know, I mean, there's other pieces I've heard that do that as well, but I think he is particularly good at that because like, I think it's easy to appreciate the weird like quarter steps and stuff in his solo, but they don't sound off. No, you can hear why they're kind of being used in a sense. You know, they make sense. And that goes back to uh, honestly. Oh, boy, I'm about to about to do it. I'm about to do it to you. 
there's a little bit of harm a lot except ah! <laughs> but no what i mean is that steve layman is not shredding mm-hmm. he's playing lines and he's playing in his you know in his wover of i mean and then microtone. i guess we get to keep going because like each fucking one is a fucking uh literary and chromatic micro scale oh my god every one. Uh, and stop. we can we, can, we <laughs> can fucking trace the path <laughs> we can trace the path we cracked the code <laughs> george russell no! <laughs> okay uh we're back from our temporary <laughs> insanity a temporary <laughs> insanity <laughs> basically there's something that steve layman brings to the table compositionally that i don't want to say isn't accounted for in his theory but like is a basic form of composition yeah. where you have tension and release you have direction you have magnitude it's like a vector you have you I, have an idea and you execute it in a compelling way yes orally um, i mean here like personal experience i he did a fucking talk when we were in college um actually god i think it might have been before you were there even so it might have been like going into my sophomore year i think um and this was before this album um i forget what the album before this was but no nope, doesn't remember. matter yeah. um but i do recall in his talk like it was pretty cool he just like basically sat in the room and gave us all scores and he just like played recordings of his music and talked about what he's doing and you got to like see like how he wrote it and it's all like okay that's cool that's interesting um but even at that point, he essentially was somewhat new. Like, it's obviously an idea he'd been playing with for a long time. Uh, but this is a fresh concept, relatively speaking. But this man has obviously been playing music for and writing music for a really Forever, long time. Yeah. So, and even on the Rudra shit, he'll dip into this kind of thing. But it's a lot more, well, straight. It's grounded, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I mean, I think that's an important point and goes with all these composers that we've listened to. Is like, you really got to start, at, like as a good musician, a good composer, then you get in this weird shit for sure. And cause that's what you want to do. That's cause you get bored or you feel like there's something else there that, yeah. you, hear, you know, but you have to go through the process. But yeah. Could you imagine like you and I just being like, Hey, let's write a really quick, uh, fucking song like this. Yeah. It'd probably suck. It'd be a disaster. <laughs> like we, we have to spend time. Damn. Cause I think not to like be up our own ass, but I think we're both good enough musicians to do it eventually yes you have to spend the time you have to do the brain work to sift through Mm -hmm. the wrong ways to do it yeah even someone like rudresh um Mm -hmm. who i would say all his theoretical ideas while being advanced they're all sort of rooted in maybe like 20th century harm like classical kind of stuff they're pretty explored yeah yeah but yeah there's nothing he's not really bringing anything like the synthesis is new but i don't think there's any concept that he himself came up with and was just like here's my shit um but, you know, even that, that all stems from the fact that this guy could blow over any fucking song ever and sound ever. amazing. Yeah, just playing straight ahead. He's a strong uh, yeah. sense of, I don't know how to break it down. Because it's like, it's ironic almost that we're talking about these very esoteric mm-hmm. and advanced, quote unquote, jazz theories. But it still boils down to the very basics. Make it really it does. Yeah. Make it interesting to people to listen to. How you do that depends, but like mostly it's through a strong contour of melody, a strong sense of tension and release, all this kind of basic I, yeah. stuff. And honestly, uh, another point, Steve specifically, um, I was thinking, listen, like when I started kind of of electronic music, it's like how you could do this really easily electronically. Cause you can literally go in and get the exact pitch you're looking for. Yeah, you can edit it. Yeah. You know? Um, but I'm glad he didn't do that. Cause to me, that would probably sound very flat. Um, it wouldn't work robotic. Yeah. It's the fact that there's live musicians and that they do have to compromise. They do have to sort of fit yes. everything into something playable for them. You know, I think that kind of grounds it a little more too. I agree. You know? it, it, well, it sounds <clears throat> this, that the clips we played sound great mm-hmm. from even just like a human perspective. Exactly. It just sounds mm-hmm. awesome. Uh, I, and you're right. If you put this on a computer and edited it that way, it wouldn't sound the same. It's yeah. it's just the concept. There's this quote. I don't remember who it's by. It might be Oscar Wilde, but it's like the absence of limitations is the enemy of art. I think that was Fraser Crane. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, very awesome philosopher Fraser Crane is. No. So the idea is that you can't do this live to that extent mm-hmm. with mathematical perfection sure but making the compromise and having the limitation on it creates its own sort of beauty it really does um i'm reminded of something he said in that talk too 
and I think it was an early inspiration for this kind of thinking was um, some of my favorite albums are the Miles Davis Quintet with like oh. Herbie and Tony and oh, the Wayne Shorter. The disgusting shit, yeah. Uh-huh. And so he was talking about Miles and Wayne playing heads together and how fucking out of tune they were from yeah, each other, yeah. you know? And he's like, they're playing unison, but they're clearly not playing unison. And so he took that concept and was just like, okay, let's keep going with that. And, you know, in my opinion, it's some of the best music ever made. And it's like, this shit is human, you know, yeah, like yeah, yeah. it's inherently human. Like they were not purposely, obviously trying to, be no, it just from each happens other. When yeah, you play. exactly. It happens. And like, mm-hmm. yeah, I like, I make fun of it, whatever. Yeah. But like, it's that album or those albums. Yeah. Two or three or four. Mm-hmm. All are, First of all, incredible. Yeah. But uh, the mm, Steve Lehman talks about Miles Davis a lot. Um, if you read his dissertation, which I, some reason, read all of, uh, uh, his doctorate dissertation in for Columbia University, he talks about these pieces a lot. Uh, he mentions a couple other spectrographical pieces he's done. But he really just always goes back to Miles Davis and the fundamentals and how you make a strong composition. Yeah. Even with these fucking weird-ass fucking bullshit... Mm-hmm. You have to start at the beginning. Yeah. And that would be George Russell. Ah! <laughs> I hate you. Uh-huh. All right. Are we done talking about weird jazz shit? I think we're done think talking we're done. about weird jazz I'm, shit. I'm done. Yeah. That was Ugh. a lot of weird Woo. jazz shit. Okay. Dropped. Oh, <laughs> oh. Just <laughs> like all these fucking record deals these guys thought they had. Oh. Uh. It was mentally exhausting talking about the theory and we didn't even make it. <laughs> we didn't even create this thing. It's fucking. We can't I'm, even play any of it. Yeah, dude. I, 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 next time I try some Threadgill shit, you just come over and shoot me, okay? Dude, I've heard you lay down some sick fucking uh, Lydia and Diminished, though, oh, man. Bro. Yeah, dude. I lay. Yeah, it was funny though. I, like as I was reading that book, I was listening to a lot of Alan Holdsworth, oh, and that yeah. dude actually does like that scale a lot. He, really? I don't think he uses it anywhere no, in the same way as Russell context, is doing, yeah. but like he does like that. Interesting. <laughs> Alan Holdsworth, R.I.P., is awesome. Yep. Very cheesy, dude. That's, That's why I like lawyer. him. That's why I like him. I like the cheese. Uh, Jesus Christ. Shall we rant? I think we shall. You got anything for me? Uh, you know, this isn't really a full it's rant. It's about George Russell. It's, <laughs> no! Uh, this is literally just me being a petty asshole. Uh, but Bring I it. If, I don't know if you've heard, but Miley Cyrus dropped a new album. I did not a hear A couple that. days ago. So there's been all this shit going around. And you know what? I actually am a Miley Cyrus fan as a person. I I'm, like her as an individual. I agree. I don't like her music whatsoever. <laughs> um, but she has gone through, you know, she was like Hannah Montana shit. And then she tried to do the disillusionment. Like, then she tried yeah. to go into the uh, urban market um, and do that kind of thing. And then a little more poppy with like Wrecking Ball and all that yeah, crap. Yeah. Um, so now she's doing rock. Yeah. And she had a brief transition between her pop and rock in the cheese realm. I don't know if you've heard of the song The Climb. I have, actually. That's like in between her pop and her rock, I think. It's like two or three years ago. Well, here's the weird thing. So I know you stopped watching Black Mirror. Like, you didn't see the most recent season, which is good because it's terrible. Okay. Perhaps the worst episode is a Miley Cyrus episode. She in it? She is. Wow. Where she plays a pop singer, and there's like some weird like technology shit. But at the end, it turns out she's a rocker at heart. So it's like literally that episode, and now it's real life so i guess like black mirror every episode i guess but that's um, so interesting <laughs> i'm i'm serious that's that's really interesting it's weird right i almost so promotion is a very strange game right now with the advent of the internet mm. like even like tiktok has changed the game a yeah, lot sure. other things of that nature i'm almost maybe Maybe she planned that shit, dude. Oh, I boy, yeah, someone planned that. Yeah, yeah, or yeah, her agents like, or whatever. Yeah, I mean, here's the That's premise. So here's the premise of the episode, real quick, just to give you more context. She's like a pop singer, like a Hannah Montana type. Okay. And there's all these little dolls that you get the doll, and you guys can talk to the doll, and they're oh, advanced okay. enough that they can talk yeah. back to you. But because still, Black Mirror's like yeah, a dystopian yeah, feature yeah, exactly. show, yeah. But it's still like AI. It's not really, but essentially. She wants to break away from pop because she's writing her own real serious kind oh, of music. Yeah. It's real dark and edgy, you know, rock and that's roll. Not, yeah, that sounds like my uh, thing to me. So her mom, like, drugs her and puts her in a coma or some shit. Okay. <laughs> and her somehow her brain ends up in this doll, and this girl gets in, and then she's like, I'm the real one, and they have to, like, save her, blah, blah, blah. 
It's not good. It's one of the worst episodes they ever made. <laughs> um, but the very last scene is the girl that had the doll and Miley Cyrus have formed like a punk rock band together. Sure. And it's just them playing a crowd and everyone's just like, this is punk. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then Miley Cyrus dropped a rock album. So uh, again, it's like I, I listened to it today. Because again, I don't. I'm not a fan of her music, but I like her as a person. I think she's kind of fun. Sure, yeah, you know, and uh, I think I think she's adapted to the challenges of the music. She industry really has very well. Because getting out of the Disney role is very yes, difficult. Yes. I don't know. Uh-huh. She made it look easy. She had some controversy for a while too. She did. She did. Well, she, she again. Oh, that's probably all planned. Blah, blah, blah. May, I mean, maybe. Yeah, it's like the Kanye theory. Yeah, was the VMA right, planned? Yeah, exactly. Like, who knows? <laughs> but it, she, I'm saying she like she did very well for herself. Yeah. No, getting she's out, getting she's out of the done. Disney. Yes, she's done well. Um, but anyway, so she comes out with the this rock album, it's supposed to be like '80s rock. I mean, to me, it sounds like sort of like synthy pop. Synth pop. Okay. Yeah. I mean, this actually, I looked it up. There's like real instruments on it. Some. Somewhat. Somewhat. Yes. The uh, drummer from the Foo Fighters apparently plays on it. So, oh. You know, it's good. When the Foo Fighters are involved in it anyway. I can't remember that dude's name. Taylor Hawkins. Taylor Hawkins. Uh, <laughs> Taylor Coleman Hawkins. Um, <laughs> God damn it. I'm sorry. Um, so I listened to it, and yeah, there's like, there's some distorted guitar every once in a while. Actually, it opens with a bass riff, which... To be fair, I don't know any pop album that's open with a bass riff ever in this like current age. <laughs> in current year. Yeah. Year of our Lord 2020. Uh-huh. Um, and it's not my favorite music, but it's like, okay, fine. It's like synthy pop with a little bit of fake edge to it. I mean, it, <laughs> that's it, a great way to put it. Well, you know, and I was, this is a little side rant, but like all the guitars, and I specifically noticed these, but I think it applies to most of the live instruments. They still sound like computers clean cut it's just yeah. so like well you smush the living shit exactly out of it. Yeah. and it's chop it all up so it's perfect and five, so it's that's like, five seconds of summer shit it man. really no that's literally what i thought when i was listening to it um but anyway the real petty rant is that everywhere online everyone's like miley cyrus is bringing rock back she's <sighs> saving rock this is great oh, and i'm very embarrassed i'm also embarrassed that the guest artists on this album are billy idol and joan jett and stevie <laughs> nicks Hey, no, 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 that's not embarrassing, dude. They've had, they haven't had careers for like 20 years. Uh, it's embarrassing. <laughs> oh, come on, I mean, dude. I'm glad they're getting a paycheck. Exactly. But like, that's what I'm talking about. But everyone's like, like I listen to the fucking Billy Idol song. How it's bad. like so embarrassing. So Billy Idol's like not actually good ever, but like. But like he had that thing. He had like those two songs and then, well, then the rest. Well, of- you know, I like Billy Idol. He had his thing. I'm sure. not saying it's like. See, okay, you only yeah. say that because you have his haircut. Ah, <laughs> uh it was funny though. I was listening to the song and I was like, "I swear this is in B minor," because every fucking Billy Idol song is in B minor. Was, is it always? Is it true? B flat minor. Oh. Oh, so close. So close. Well, no, that's a tune down a half step nah. for the guitar, right? Because he's old. Exactly. He's old. He can't even know. It's, Dude, it all. It. It's all true. <laughs> so this is all petty. I know no one actually thinks that she's saving rock and roll. I just hate the fact that people, Miley Cyrus can come out with this and people will say, "Oh my God, rock and roll is back." Ugh, that's painful. You're right. That's pretty painful. <sighs> My rant is significantly stupider. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, no. <laughs> when I was listening to Henry Threadgill, <laughs> I uh, initially searched for in for a penny, in for a pound on Spotify, and it came up with... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it came up with this band I'd never heard of somehow, because I really like extremely cheesy, shitty disco. Oh, I don't want to... Oh, we're going there, dude. It's this. It came up with this band called Arabesque, which they started uh, right about the ABBA time, uh, 78, 77. They started out their career in like the Euro disco scene. And I think they're German maybe. But the point is they had a song called In For A Penny, In For A Pound. And since George, wow, George Russell, no. Henry Threadgill, no. <laughs> uh, Henry Threadgill was not on Spotify. Imagine that fucking world. He's only on Bandcamp. Band yeah, he's only, <laughs> exactly, he's only on Bandcamp. So like... I was searching for him on Spotify because, you know, what do you do? And then it came up with this arabesque band. And I was like, you know, there's three girls on the cover. I'm going to listen to it. You're probably going to like it knowing you. I'm probably going to like it. I love ABBA a lot. (laughs) Here we go. Yep. This was literally the worst part of every ABBA song in one band. (laughs) <laughs> I listened to like five of their songs just to get a feel and like the production's worse. The ideas are worse. Everything is just like a worse version of ABBA and I still like it. Oh no. <laughs> I still like it. 
think it's like a knockoff ABBA band or something. I think, you think so. they're trying to like cash in on the ABBA train. Uh, but the problem is the timeline doesn't work. Well, maybe ABBA's a little earlier than I think. But like the timeline seems like they're almost the exact same time. And they were famous. Okay. Arabesque was a famous group. All right. They toured Europe for a long time. But like, I just, I, I, they were so much shittier than ABBA in every way. And I liked <laughs> them a lot. <laughs> but, mm. and okay. The real problem with this song, In For A Penny, In For A Pound, is that the verses are very strongly in E minor, you know, lots of dramatic statements and dynamics, things that are typical of an ABBA song or like uh, yeah. disco in general. And then the chorus is, e, so again, verses E minor, the choruses drop E major. Ugh. And it's so direct. You I know hate that, it. I hate it. You know that one song uh, that's like a meme video? I, 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 yeah. I'm your little butterfly. Yeah, yeah. Like, imagine that song if it dropped to major on that chorus. It's like that bad. I, 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 I'm your little butterfly. <laughs> See, I like that motion so much, but man, no. people fuck it up no, 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 so no, no, no. hard. No, you can't do it. No, I, I, uh, you can't do it. And actually, we're going to transition from my rant oh, here we go. to the listening of the All week. All right. Uh, because I was listening to a musical that you recommended to me and showed me a couple of times, faves. a couple tracks of mm -hmm. called Dear Evan Hansen, and it's fucking awesome. And it's a very modern uh, plot and got a couple. It's interesting because the music is very s simple, quote unquote, orchest orchestrally. Sure. And musically. But like there's a lot of little modern things, a lot of modern things in the music. Like, for instance, the idea that major chords always have the four in it, like all the mm -hmm. time, right? It's yeah, like, yeah. For instance, like a C. So, you know who would have something to say about that? <gasps> Is it George Russell? That might be the first auxiliary. <laughs> <scale>. <laughs> <laughs> it's the first so, Dear Evan Hansen is in C or is in C first auxiliary Lydian mode. Okay. But so it's very modern musical in terms of plot, lots of mental illness ideas yep. and like suicide and all this kind of kind of deeper shit. They play with some humor. Very good musical. However, if we play the clip from that at the end of this or beginning of this episode, we're going to get fucking DMC8 faster than life itself. Oh, I'm sure. Because musicals are insane about their uh, intellectual property rights. So I'm going to go ahead and put Arabesque oh, as my God, listening of the okay. week. And you're going to get the fucking in for a penny, in for a <sighs> pound at the end of this fucking episode. And there's nothing you can do about it. Yay. What have you been listening to, bro? Uh, I've been listening to my guy, Mike Watt. Mike Watt? You might know it's him as... It's very close to a dirty joke somewhere. Uh, you might know him as the bass player for the Minutemen. Yeah. Oh, yeah. But oh, is his previous group? Or yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, that was... He was the Minutemen singer, or guitar singer died. Uh, Mike Watt has had a pretty long solo career. Really good bass player. Really mm -hmm. cool songwriter. Um, I've been listening to his album, Contemplating the Engine Room. Which I found out is a concept album. Don't ask yeah. me how. I don't know how it is, but apparently it is. Um, it's good. It's actually Nels Klein playing guitar. Sure. Nels, that's kind of how Nels actually got his start. Really was, was via the fucking dude from Yeah, Man. yeah. Okay. I mean, he was doing stuff before that, but he toured with him and was in his band for a long time. Is Nels Klein that old? Yes, Nels Klein's like 60 something. What? Yeah. He looks pretty good, dude. He does, actually, yeah. yeah. Um, but it's good, weird rock. Okay. You know, it's not like beef heart weird or anything like that. Yeah, but, but it's, it's got it's off it's got kilter, edges. you know, it's funny, the lyrics, his singing voice, he always sounds like a pirate or something to me. He has, yeah, <laughs> he's got a good way with lyrics for sure. Yeah. So it's just it's probably one of his like most well known albums, but yeah. it's a good one. Check it out. Sure. Yeah, Mike Watt, he's yeah. the man. How did he die, dude? It was oh uh Pat Boone, the Minuteman guy? Yeah. I forget. It was something weird, I think. Yeah. I, it was something very strange. or something? Well, uh, I mean, probably. Uh, but right. like, it was it was like a weird moment or something. Anyway. Yeah. Anyway. Uh, for also, that Minuteman album is fucking disgusting. Minuteman are awesome. Yeah. That's a super group. I can't remember who else it is. Oh, is it really? Yeah. Hmm. The drummer's like from... Some other some weird other punk band. Or... <gasps> Whatever. Anyway, so you've been listening to Mike Watt. Yeah. Good psychedelic weird rock. Album name one more time? Uh, Contemplating the Engine Room. Oh, that's right. That's why I had to mm, fucking have yeah. you sitting here because it's fucking stupid. Yep. Yep. Okay. Well, with that, this concludes our extremely long episode of alternative Music. jazz theories and their esotericness. And I'm sure after listening to this, you, along with us, also want to die. And drink. And drink. And never listen to music again. So, uh, Steel Reserve. 211. Please sponsor us. Please. Yeah. We love you. We, we love, love you, you so much. We drink like a hard pineapple every episode, man. Oh, you're tropic storming I'm today. tropic storming. Ah, with that, I'm Jake. Matt.
he's drinking right now, <laughs> if you, in case you didn't hear that. Oh. His, his name is Matt. And this is Music Sucks and I Want to Die. Subscribe on YouTube. We are making videos of all these now. When our camera doesn't malfunction, Matt. And uh, <laughs> we're, on Sp- <laughs> yeah, we're on Spotify, Stitcher, TuneIn, Apple Podcasts. And because we're on those, we're on like all the other ones, I think. And Twitter. And Twitter. Oh, my God. Our Twitter's hilarious. It's lit as fuck. Please follow our Twitter at Music Sucks Cast. Because someone took our real name. <laughs> we're out of here. Bye. Bye. <laughs>